Oh, man. Well, as I say, I want to I read a verse from uh, uh, the, the book of, of Hosea in the Old Testament. It comes after the book of Daniel, for anybody who doesn't know. You have got a contents page in your Bible, by the way. And there's no shame in turning to the contents page. But, uh, but there it is. After the book of Daniel, you've got Hosea. And, uh, and I just want us to turn to chapter 4. And just uh, one verse there and it says in verse 6 just part of a verse actually verse 6 my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge now first of all I, I want I want you to notice it says here and this is this is the Lord speaking by the way He's speaking through the prophet Hosea. Hosea is writing these things. Hosea was preaching these things, but it's the Lord speaking through him. You know, whether, whether we are reading a book in the Old Testament, like the book of the prophet Hosea, or 1 Kings, or 2 Kings, or whatever it is, Genesis, or whether we're reading the Gospels in the New Testament, or the Epistles, you know, it is the Word of God. It's the Word of God. We've, we've just read it in 2 Timothy chapter 3. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And all means all there. So, so the book of the prophet Hosea is of no less value than some other book in, in the Bible. It's the, it's the Word of God. So this is the Lord speaking. And I want you to notice he says, My people... Uh, destroyed for lack of knowledge. So, so this is speaking to God's people. My people are uh, destroyed for lack of knowledge. You see, you could say people are uh, destroyed for lack of knowledge, and that would be true. People generally are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And, and, and I would say that that is true. And it's especially true in a gospel context, by the way. It's true in a gospel context. People need to know the Lord Amen. more than anything else. You know, go to university and learn what you like. But the, but the most important thing that people need to know is the Lord. Amen. People need to know the Lord. People need to hear the message of the gospel, the way of salvation, because there's only one. There's only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said that. As the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 10, just read from verse 11, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, that's a wonderful verse. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, it doesn't matter whether you're from you know, Botswana or Bulgaria or, you know, the UK or the United Arab Emirates. So where are you from? It doesn't make any difference. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a wonderful verse. But then he goes on to say, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So, in other words, it's vital that the message of the gospel be preached. And so Jesus said to his disciples, just before he ascended into heaven, he said to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This is what Jesus said to his disciples, but it wasn't just for them, it's a commission to his church down the centuries, right up to this present time. It's what we call the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then Jesus went on to say, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. That's Mark chapter 16 verses 15 to 16. You see, without knowledge, without knowledge of Christ, without knowledge of the gospel, people will perish in their sins. Jesus himself said, in John uh, chapter 8, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. 
What does he mean? If you do, if you do not believe, actually in the, in, the, in the original there, it says, if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. You'll notice if you re look at your Bible there, he is in italics, that means it's supplied. But in the original it says, if you don't believe that I am, so who's I am? It's to show Jehovah, it's the Lord, it's Yahweh, I am. Who I am, it's the name of God. If you do not believe I am, you will die in your sins, you perish. If you do not believe that I am he, who? Well, the Messiah, the Son of God, the, the Messiah of Israel, the Saviour of the world. Unless you believe in me, you will die in your sins. Clearly then, it is of vital importance that people get to hear the message of the Gospel, the Biblical Gospel, that says all of us, all of us, without exception, all of us, are born with a sin nature and separated from God because of our sin. God is a holy and righteous God. And you know, heaven is a holy place, you know that, don't you? So what would heaven become if he let sin into heaven? It, it wouldn't be holy any longer, would it? But it's a place where righteousness alone dwells. So if we are ever to dwell with him in that new heaven and new earth where righteousness alone dwells, something's going to have to be done about our sin. And if we are ever to have a right relationship with a God who's holy, something is going to have to be done about our sin, eh? Because you cannot walk with a holy God, you cannot live in right relationship with a holy God whilst you're still in in your sins and under his wrath and condemnation. So something has to be done about our sins. And we have all sinned, the Bible tells us that. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know that's true and so do I. And the Bible's absolutely clear. We can't do anything. We've just been singing it in that hymn. It's why I chose it. It's not by anything that we can do ourselves that we can make by which we can make ourselves right with God. That's not possible. You know, even, even if I lived a perfect life from, 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 from now on until the day I drop, you know, very good. But that does nothing, that does nothing to, 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 uh, do, to um, uh, uh, satisfy God and satisfy his rights for all the sins I committed before. And I've got to stand before God in the judgment. In other words, we're, we're all finished <laughs> if it's left to us finished and by that I don't mean we die and that's it you're not conscious of anything because the Bible's clear it's put eternity within our hearts well you know we're all going to live forever not in these bodies thankfully but, but we are all going to live for he forever we're all of us going to be conscious forever everyone because you put eternity within our hearts the question is not you know, will I, you know, live forever or not? The question is, where will you spend eternity? That's the question. And according to the Bible, there's, there's, there's two places, ultimately. There's two places, there's no purgatory. That's an invention of man. There's no limbo, there's no kind of in-between place where the undecided go. There, 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 there are two ultimate destinations. It's either going to be eternal blessedness with God in heaven or else ultimately it's going to be the lake of fire that's the Bible that's what it says okay so so unless something is done about our sin then we're in a bad place aren't we but God so loved the world that he provided a way so that not, we could not just be forgiven for our sin but that the debt owed by all of our sin could be paid for so that God could wipe the slate clean as it were, cancel out the debt completely and accept us just as if we'd never sinned. And what he did, what he did was he sent his son and his son willingly came. He took upon himself our humanity. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Doesn't mean he sinned. Or, or that he came into the world as a sinner. He was, came into the world sinless and perfect through virgin birth and lived a sinless, perfect life. And then he died on the cross. And God says, there on the cross, he laid upon him the iniquity of us all. 
and he poured out his wrath upon his own son in my place in my place and yours and Jesus suffered and he died to pay the price for our sin and then having died they took him down certified him dead and put him in a tomb and put a stone against against the doorway and put a Roman seal on it and a guard but three days later he rose from the dead and he came out and he was seen alive for 40 days and then he ascended into heaven and right now he's seated at God's right hand God has given him the name which is above every other name so we've been saying on a Sunday morning these last couple of, couple of weeks Jesus said to his disciples all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth he has the name above every other name and under his foot is Satan and every other angelic being and every other power and dominion and principality whether in the seen or unseen world they're all under his feet and he has the highest position of all God has given him the name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father and God's offer is simply this that if we're willing to turn from our sin and turn to God and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ believe that believe who he is he's the son of God the eternal son of the living God believe in what he he did what was accomplished through his death on the cross that there he paid the price for all of our sin and made full atonement for us to bring us to God if we put our trust and our faith in him and him alone not a church not a pastor not the Pope not me <laughs> please you know not any institution not a religion but you put your trust you put your faith in Christ alone to save you God's willing to wipe the slate clean to forgive you all of your sin and to accept you into right relationship with him he'll give you the gift of the Holy Spirit he'll make you a brand new person and then he'll put you on this narrow uh, uh, path that leads to eternal life and one day he's coming back and he'll take you home to the place you really belong and I'm telling you this eye has not seen or ear heard neither has any human mind scarce begun to comprehend the glory of of what God has prepared for his people that's the gospel simply that and, and my point is here is simply this you know people need to know that because without that knowledge people perish of course as I've just I hope I've just pointed out mere knowledge of it isn't enough it says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved again Jesus said he who believes and is baptized will be saved it says in John's Gospel chapter 1 verse, verses 12 and 13 but as many as received him to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name and Ephesians 2 verses 8, 8 and 9 by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God lest anyone should boast we're saved by the grace of God through faith so it isn't knowledge alone that saves it's faith but the faith that saves is based on something real something true you know it's not a figment of our imagination we don't we don't we won't put our faith in you know fairy tales or fables or anything like that our faith is based on something true something real it's faith in a person the Lord Jesus Christ who he is and what he's done in order to save us and without that knowledge of him and the gospel truth no one can be saved one's faith would be in the wrong thing for sure see without him and without faith the sinner is condemned Jesus said condemned to eternal destruction and that is conscious torment of separation from God for all eternity everlasting destruction as it puts it in Paul's epistle to Thessalonians 
So, of course, it's true to say people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, lack of knowledge of the gospel truth, lack of knowledge of the Saviour Jesus. But actually, when you look at this verse that I've read from Hosea, that is not really what this verse is saying, is it? It says, my people, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. This is the Lord speaking to, to his people, his own people. And so I want to apply this this evening, if I can, to what is happening right now and the situation as it is right now. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, it says. Now let me just make one thing clear before I go any further with, with, with this. And, 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 and it's this, my belief is that no person who is genuinely saved will be eternally lost. And I believe I can prove that from the scripture quite easily. It's not what I'm going to be talking about this evening. We've preached on this many times before. If a person is genuinely saved by the grace of God, that person cannot finally be damned or, or eternally lost. You see, it's not about how we keep a grip on Jesus. It's his grip on us that will save us. And, and, and it says in Philippians, he that began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will. Okay, so that is, that is my belief, and that is what the Bible teaches, that if a person is genuinely saved, they will not ultimately be lost. Okay? So the genuine believer will not, perish eternally in that sense. The genuine believer is not destined for eternal destruction as the unbeliever is. But a Christian believer can mess his life up if he chooses to do things that are bad for him, bad for him and bad for those around him. A Christian believer can do, you can mess your life up he may destroy his health. He may destroy his marriage or his relationship with other people. There are choices that a Christian could make that would ruin his relationship with the Lord. It's true. Just because a person is a Christian doesn't mean he will not suffer the effects of wrong choices in his life physically, mentally, emotionally, and even spiritually. I'll give you an example, a simple example. If I decide that I'm going to start drinking two bottles of whiskey every night and a, cup and a few beers, right, and I do that consistently every night, do you think that just because I'm a Christian I won't end up with cirrhosis of the liver of whatever it is you get? Do you, do you think that I'm going to be perfectly healthy if I continue to do it? Do you think if I decide I'm going to smoke 80 cigarettes a day, Woodbines, if they still do, I don't know. <laughs> you know if, if I decide I'm going to be an 80, 80 a day man, do you think that just because I'm a Christian, that's going to, that's going to be good, for, you know, I'm, I'm not going to suffer the ill effects of that health-wise, seriously. Isn't that going to happen, is it? If I, if I take things into my body that are bad for me, they're going to be bad for me whether I'm a Christian or not. Being a Christian does not exempt you. You know, if you, if you decide you're going to go and go to McDonald's every day, twice a day, and have a mega burger or whatever they have, you know, you know and, you, and you do that every day, do you think that just because you're a Christian, that's not going to affect you adversely? Because it is. That would be a bad choice on your part. You know, or, or, or similarly, you know, you, you, know you, you could put the same thing into other aspects of your life. You know, if you're, a, if you're a married man and you decide to start knocking about with other women, I mean, do you seriously think that just because you're a Christian, your marriage is going to be okay? Of course it isn't. That's a, that, that would be a, a, a bad choice to make in life. 
You know, and, and the effects of that wouldn't just affect you. It would affect your wife. It would affect your children. It would affect a whole lot of other people. So I'm simply pointing out that just because we're Christians, we're not exempt from the, 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 the effects of bad choices in our life. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, it says here. And this is referring to God's people. Destroyed, he says, for lack of knowledge. In, in, in some way or another, the people of the Lord, uh, uh, the people the Lord was speaking to here through the prophet Hosea were being destroyed. The, the lives, in some way, were being destroyed, whether physically or morally, emotionally, spiritually, their lives were being destroyed. And he says it's through lack of knowledge. But here's the thing, see? Here's the thing. It wasn't that the, necess the knowledge they needed was not available to them. Because it was. They had gone astray. They were going after other gods. And they were walking in the ways of the world around them instead of remaining faithful to God and trusting and serving God alone. They were looking at what the world had and they were saying, I need that. I want that. I must have that. And even though God's word forbade it, forbid it they said, no, we need that. We want that. But the Lord sent his prophets, men of God, who showed them where they were going wrong. Prophets who, who called sin, sin. They called it out for what it was. They didn't beat about the bush because they didn't want to upset people. They said it as it was. This is the thing about the prophets of God. They called sin, sin. Call a spade a spade. That, that, that's just what they did. They didn't beat about the bush. That's what people want you to do, you know. Just talk around it. Be politically correct. Don't say, don't make waves. Don't say anything to upset anybody. Just, just waffle around it. But the prophets didn't do that. They said it as it was. They called out the sin. And they pointed them back to God. They pointed them to God's word. And they called the people to repentance, you see. Men of God who brought the word of God to God's people that they might know what they ought to do. They were not bad, you know, uh, people with a bad attitude who just wanted to lord it over people. Not at all. You know, some of the prophets were absolutely burdened that they had to bring this message. You look at Jeremiah. He's got it. He said, it's, like, it's a pain. It's like a pain in my stomach. It burns and I, and I don't, I don't want to do it anymore. But it just comes up and it comes out and I, can't, I cannot help it. I cannot hold it back. But he didn't want to because every time he opened his mouth, he was in trouble with somebody. They were not people with a bad attitude. They were people who had the burden of the word of God upon the heart and they just had to declare that to the people. So you see, Knowledge was available to these people. But look what it says in this verse. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. So in other words, this wasn't just your average Israelite we're talking about here. We're talking about people who were the priests, charged with the responsibility of not just doing the stuff in the temple, but teaching people. Teaching people the truth of God's word. And he says, you have rejected knowledge. Therefore, I've rejected you from being priests. But I think the point here is this wasn't mere ignorance. That's the point. It wasn't mere ignorance on the part of the people in question. It was willful ignorance, you see. It was willful ignorance. God had given them his word, and his word was clear. God had given them prophets to bring his word to the people directly. God sent to them watchmen 
to warn them of the, the, the dangers that faced them if they continued to walk on the path that they were on, trouble was coming their way. If they continued to walk in their sinful ways, if they continued to anchor after the stuff the world had and go for all that, then trouble was ahead. The, the, God sent them watchmen to warn them of the dangers that were coming upon them. But they refused to listen to any of it. That's the problem. And in so doing, they rejected knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, but it was because they would not listen. They would not receive the knowledge and w that would have saved them from that which actually was destroying them. Isn't that sad? Isn't that crazy? Isn't it crazy that the knowledge is there? And God sent somebody to tell them and to spell it out for them, but they wouldn't listen to it. We well, see the same thing is happening today. That's the point. God's people are being destroyed for lack of knowledge. It's happening today. I'm of, course, I, of course, I'm referring to the things that are happening in the world today. This global tyranny in all its forms that we and the people of this world have been experiencing in some way or another for the last 20, 21 months, I'm losing count. This is massive. You know it is. This is global in scale. And it's leading to something. It's leading to something. And you know, we've been talking about this for months now. What it is what it's for, and what it's leading to, according to the Bible. I'm talking about the whole COVID agenda, the pandemic, The pandemic because it was planned. That is so obvious now. You know, when I first started saying that, some people were saying, ah, conspiracy theorist. But it's there now, and all the information is there that makes that clear. This is a pandemic. The face masks, the lockdowns, the hand washing, the distancing, the introduction of the thing. The thing they want everyone to take. The digital pass and what that's for. The injuries and the deaths that have been caused by the you-know-what. The information's all out there. Yeah. And where all this fits in, you see, with the prophetic scriptures, particularly relating to the end times. And there are some people who are listening. Praise God. There, there are some people who are listening. But what I found, and what I find distressing is that there are others, Christians I mean, now I'm talking about Christians here, and there are many of them who it seems refuse to listen. They, are ref they refuse to listen. It doesn't matter what information you present them with, it doesn't matter how loud I shout or somebody else shouts, it doesn't matter what you put in front of them, it doesn't make any difference. It's not that they can't understand it, it's not that they can't understand my accent or somebody else's accent, it's that they will not look at it, they will not listen to it. They'll not listen to anything other than what comes through the mainstream media who do not pr present a balance, balanced information. That, that much is obvious. In fact, organisations like the BBC are amongst the greatest purveyors and pro um, propagators of misinformation and disinformation. And they are the ones who claim that we are putting out misinformation and disinformation when it's them. It's them. It's pure propaganda that would make Joseph Goebbels proud. Yet these people I'm referring to prefer that, it would seem, even though it's, it's entirely, uh, it's, it's working to 
to, to prevent knowledge from being circulated. They prefer that, it would seem, to the truth. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they've rejected knowledge. So what happens? And they'll do as they're instructed to do. That's what happens. Remember, we're talking about Christians here. They'll do as they're told to do. And although the watchmen warn, although the watchmen continue to sound the alarm, they won't listen. They've stopped their ears, you see. They won't listen. And so when they are told to take the you-know-what, they'll take it. And when they're called to take the second one, they'll take it. And when they're called to take the third and the fourth, and the f they'll take it if they survive that long. They'll take it. And though people like me have tried to tell them what is in it, they won't listen. What's in it? Well, again, I, can, I cannot stress enough, this, and I know I've read this before, that this... This is directly from the government website, the UK government website, and this is contents of the pack and other information, what COVID-19 vaccine AstraZeneca contains. Okay, this is from the horse's mouth, so to speak. This is from them. This is not off a conspiracy website. One dose, 0 0.5 millilitres contains COVID-19 vaccine CHADOX1-S recombinant 5, five times 10, 10 viral particles recombinant replication deficient chimpanzee adenovirus vector encoding the SARS-CoV-2 spike glycoprotein produced in genetically modified human embryonic kidney HEK293 cells. Off the government website, that, that's what it contains amongst other things. Okay, so for anybody who's not been following these and is thinking to themselves, well, what on earth is HEK293? Well, let me tell you. HEK293 cells were generated in 1973 by transfection of cultures of normal human embryonic kidney cells with sheared adenovirus 5 DNA in Alex van der Ebb's laboratory in Leiden, the Netherlands. The cells were obtained from a single aborted fetus, the price, precise origin of which is unclear. The cells were cultured by van der Ebb. The transduction by adenovirus was performed by Frank Graham, a postdoc in van der Ebb's, Ebb's lab. They were published in 1977 after Graham left Leiden for McMaster University. They are called HEK since they originated in human embryonic kidney cultures. While the number 293 came from Graham's habit of numbering his experiments, the original HEK 293 cell clone was from his 293rd experiment. So 292 abort aborted fetuses uh, were used before this particular one, I guess is that was the, what that means. Graham performed the transvection a total of eight times, obtaining just one clone of cells that were cultured for several months after presumably adapting to tissue culture cells from this clone developed into the relatively stable HEK293 line. And so, so they have reproduced over and over uh, in laboratories ever since, and that is where the origin of HEK 293 is from, from an abortion that took place in 1973, from which, for, for which some Christians, and I commented on, the, on, on, a, on a comment on something, on, this was a Christian doctor, who said, if anybody's got scruples about it because it came from an abortion, they, they shouldn't really have because these are the cells that are used are not from the original, they're not from an abortion that's recently took place. It actually took place in 1973. So that makes it okay, eh? So, so I, I put a comment on. 
So how, how can you justify a murder just because it happened decades ago? So, so although my point is that although we have tried to, to give people knowledge of what is actually in it, oh, listen, to reject that knowledge. And even though people like me have tried to explain to people, for example, the physical harm it, this is causing, trying to point them to nothing but the government's own figures, which are wrong, they are grossly underestimated, but it's not a bad starting point because they are the government's or VAERS in America, or the European equivalent, I forget what that's called. You, you know, you could, you could point people, try to point people to the, 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 the official statistics, the official figures, but they won't listen. Because they've rejected knowledge, you see. And if they continue down that route, do they think that they will escape the effects of it just because they're Christians? That's the point of what I'm saying. That just because you're a Christian, if you continue to do that, you go for your next one and your next one, and do you think that you are going to escape the effects of that? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. It's not that you could say, well, I didn't know and there was no information there. The information is there. I want to share with you now, very quickly, um, a passage of, of, of Scripture um, from, again, from the Old Testament. And this is from um, Second Chronicles and um, chapter 18. And this concerns, um, well, at least partly, it, it, it concerns a, a great king of Judah by the name Jehoshaphat. And he was a godly man. He was a true man of faith. Definitely, there's no question about that. He did what was right, much of his life in the eyes of the Lord, and, and he was a godly king. He, he, he ranks up there with some of the best of the kings of, of Judah, does, does Jehoshaphat. However, he made a humongous mistake. So let me just read this passage very quickly. Jehoshaphat had riches and honour in, in abundance, and by marriage he allied, him, allied himself with Ahab. And there's his big mistake. Because Ahab, you see, was one of the most wicked kings of Israel. Jehoshaphat, one of the most godly kings of Judah. Ahab, one of the most wicked kings of Israel. And Jehoshaphat allies himself with Ahab through marriage. After some years, he went down to visit Ahab in Samaria. And Ahab killed sheep and oxen in abundance for him. And the people who were with him and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. So Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, will you go with me against Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as you are, and my people as your people, we will be with you in the war. Also, let's just stop there a minute. So here we have a godly king, he's allied with an evil king, and, uh, and the evil king says, we're at war with Ramoth Gilead, will you go with us? And he says, I am as you are, and my people are as your people. In other words, we're all one. So yes, I'll go with you. And I, and I so, sort of wonder, well, what, what on earth was he thinking? I mean, did he not know what Ahab had done? Did he not know what Ahab was like? Surely he did. Surely he did. All the information was out. Ahab's infamous. He's an evil man. He's been killing the prophets of God. He's been killing the faithful of Jehovah in his own land. Did Jehoshaphat not know? Of course he knew. But he says, I am as you are. And my people are as you, as you are people. So I ask myself, why? What was that all about? And you know, I've, I've often thought that probably what it was, was that Jehoshaphat thought that if he could kind of, you know, just, just kind of build a relationship with Ahab, maybe he could influence him for good. 
Maybe he could kind of bring him back into the fold, so to speak, you know, and reunite the people of Israel together. Maybe he could have a good sort of influence on him. They could bring them all back to the true faith. Maybe he was thinking that way. Or maybe he thought Ramoth Gilead, well, maybe they, they, they are going to be our enemy eventually. So better if we fight the, 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 the mutual enemy together, you know, strength in numbers and all that. I don't know. But he said to him, I am as you are, my people are as your people, will go to war with you. However, let's re read on. It says, also, Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, please inquire for the word of the Lord today. I remember he said, saying this to an evil king. Inquire of the word of the Lord today. So this is his godliness coming out. You know, before we go to battle, we need to hear from the Lord. So the king of Israel, Ahab, gathered the prophets together. 400 men, now these were prophets of Baal, okay, <laughs> the false prophets, the prophets of Baal, and said to them, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead or shall I refrain? So they said, go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. In other words, these people said exactly what they knew the king wanted to hear. These, these were like, these were like the, uh, the, the people today who kind of, promote the whole thing that's going on. They say exactly what the powers that be want them to say. So that's what they did. So that satisfied King Ahab. But Jehoshaphat said, you see, he realised, well, these are prophets, but they're not really, they're not the prophets of the Lord, these. I'm not sure if we can really take their word for this. So he said, is there not still a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? So the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, there is still one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. <laughs> I hate him because he never prophesies good concerning me, but always evil. He is Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say such a thing. You see, the king, king Ahab hated this prophet because, because he told the truth. And, and he always told Ahab, you know, where, where Ahab was wrong, he told him he was wrong. And he didn't want anybody telling anybody the truth, you see, so he hated him. Then, the, so what the king did was this. The king of Israel called one of his officers and said, bring Micaiah the son of Imlah quickly. The king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, clothed in their robes, sat each on his throne, and they sat at the threshing floor at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. Now Zedekiah the son of Keniah, uh, had made horns of iron for himself and he said thus says the Lord with these you shall go the Syrians until they are destroyed and all the prophets prophesied so saying go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper for the Lord will deliver it into the king's hand then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him saying now listen the words of the prophets with one accord encourage the king. Therefore, please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak encouragement. In other words, they want to tell this prophet what he's got to say. You're going to have to say what everyone else is saying. You know, the, the, the prophets the king listens to, the mainstream media of the time, they are all saying exactly the same thing, you see. And, and if you want to survive, <laughs> you're going to have to say, you're going to have to sing from the same hymn sheet. You're going to have to say the same thing you see, Micaiah. If you don't, it's curtains for you, my friend. So you're going to have to say what everyone else is saying. But Micaiah was a true man of God. And he said, as the Lord lives, whatever my God says, that will I speak. And you see, here's the thing in the church today. You've got so many, I don't mean any disrespect to anybody, it's none of my business in that sense, but you have so many leaders in the church, so many pastors and preachers who are saying just what everyone else is saying. They are singing from the same in sheet. They're saying exactly the same thing. Go up to Ramoth Gilead and let them shoot you up with you know what. Is what, is what they're basically saying, if you catch my drift. You know, that, that they're saying the same thing as everybody else. But the man of God here, he says, oh, wait a minute. You know, I, I can only say what God tells me to say. 
I'll say, I, I will say what my God tells me to say. That's a true man of God. <laughs> then he came to the king, and the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to war against Ramoth Gilead, or shall I refrain? And he said, Go and prosper, and they shall be delivered into your hand. Sarcasm, you see, and the man of God. Go, go up and prosper, they'll be delivered into your hand. And the king knew exactly what he was saying. It was pure. It was just, this is what I've been told to say. Well, do it then, you know. So the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you tell me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? Then he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let each return to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell you he would not prophesy good concerning me but evil? Then Micaiah said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will persuade Ahab, king of Israel, to go up that he may fall at Ramoth Gilead? So one spoke in this manner and another spoke in that manner. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, in what way? So he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Therefore, Luke, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets of yours. And the Lord has declared disaster against you. Then Zedekiah, the son of Keniah, went and struck Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way did the Spirit from the Lord go from me to speak to you? And Micaiah said, Indeed, you shall see on that day when you go into the inner chamber and hide. Then the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and return him to Amon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison and feed him with bread of affliction and water of affliction until I return in peace. But Micaiah said, If you ever return in peace, the Lord has not spoken by me. And he said, take heed, all you people. So what did they do with the man who told the truth? And put him in prison. I said this morning, I say it again, I don't, I don't say this lightly. I wouldn't be surprised if I end up in prison. I wouldn't be surprised. Who knows? Turns out like Australia... that could well be where one will end up because you see if you tell the truth and the truth doesn't go with the narrative what happened to Micaiah happens to those who tell the truth but you see the point is here what about Jehoshaphat in all of this what about this godly king what about this man of faith he's seen all this happen he's heard what the lying prophets have said and he doesn't buy it for one minute I don't think and he's heard what Micaiah has said. He's heard the true word of God. So what will Jehoshaphat do now? And this is what blows my mind. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and go into battle, but you put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and they went into battle. So in other words, he could... He's actually heard what the word of God has said. He's heard what the lying prophets have said. And for some ridiculous reason, he decides that he's going to go along with the lying prophets to the point where King Ahab said, tell you what, I'll go in disguise, but you put your robes on. <laughs> and he does it. I mean, how mad is that? And but for the grace of God, you see, he would have been dead. It was only the grace of God that spurred him. Amen. He would have been dead. And when Jehoshaphat, chapter 19, finally re returned to Judah safely, Yehu, the son of Anani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord, therefore the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Nevertheless, good things are found in you in that you have removed the wooden images from the land and have prepared your heart to seek God. The wrath of God was on him. Why did he do that? And why is it that faithful Christian believers are following a narrative that is completely wicked? Why is that happening? 
My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. Because they've rejected it. That's why. I want to show you quickly now a, a, a video. Uh, some of you will have seen this already uh, from, f from, from Australia. And it's, it's about Australia. So um, it only lasts a couple of minutes, this. But uh, just before it comes on, let me just say... Um, my, my family emigrated to Australia years and years ago and I've been there three times and absolutely loved it. Beautiful place, fantastic country. The lifestyle, I was never sure I would particularly like it, but I loved it. It's a, a, it was a free lifestyle, absolutely loved it, okay? That was Australia. And I sometimes thought to myself, why ever did I not em emigrate when they did? My mum wanted me to, um, could have gone there, but we never did. But watch this video. Let me paint you a picture. Australia, once known as one of the safest and freest countries in the world. A land of spirit and ceremony. A land of opportunity where the hopeful came for a new start so their children could be free and prosperous. Where the battler had a chance and poor men made good. A land where you were free to explore your surroundings. A land with room to spread one's wings. A land of brotherhood, celebration and connection. But something happened. Today is the first full day of the New World Order. We've got to accept that this is the New World Order. The New World Order and the Australia we once knew is no more. Lockdown 6 was announced on August 5. It is no longer the land of the young and free. It is now a land of division, blackmail, coercion, discrimination and medical apartheid. Get off of me! A land where movement, speech, religion and opinion are no longer free. Yeah! Protesting is illegal. We need help from our international friends. We are seeking your support to apply political and economic pressure on our leaders to change the destructive path that we are on. That is why we are organising a worldwide protest with Australia excluded in support of our plight for freedom. This is an official SOS from my beautiful country. We plead with you to hear our cries for help. isn't it unbelievable and what what I what just blows my mind you know is that I have not heard one word from our government condemning that or what's happening in Austria not a word and what that suggests to me is that they approve that they are watching very carefully what happens because you see, the fact is, what is there is coming here. You know, if that, if that was China, there would be, there would be international outrage. You know, we, we, it's as Candace Owen said last week. She, she said, I cannot understand why we've not invaded Australia. We, we invaded Iraq. We invaded Afghanistan because there were tyrannical people in power and the way that they were brutally treating the people that's why we went and thousands of american lives and british were killed in in those wars and that is just as bad yes. but our government issues not one word of condemnation that suggests to me that they approve yeah. and you see what we need to understand people is that is that what is happening there will come here it will come here. And what I say to Christians who are on the side of the narrative, you are actually supporting that. You're supporting it. You know, you, 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 you may say, no, I'm not, but you, you are actually on the same side as that. That's the point. 
You know, it, it seems that there, there is this, uh, this division that is coming now, and we have to make our mind up which side of this we're on. Because, because you can be... It's like I said this morning about 19, 1930s in Germany. You can, you can just turn and look the other way. You can bury your head in the sand and say nothing, but by saying nothing, that continues. It's time, I think, for people to stand up for what is right. That, that, the, the international uh, 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 government should be condemning that, but they're not. Why? Because they're all in lockstep together. But when the Christian church says nothing, that's, that is what bothers me, I think, the most. So let me show you another picture now. This is not a video, this is, this is just a picture. And again, so, some of you will have seen this this week. This is from um, uh, a church in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, this is some men putting a big banner up outside the church and the next picture will show you what the whole thing actually says. The blood of Jesus will not save you from Covid get vaccinated that's on a Christian church the blood of Jesus will not underlined save you from Covid and that is on a Christian church the fact is friends that that is blasphemy and and the people who've put that up as far as I can see they are not Christians in anything but name because if that's what they believe what they've got effectively is another saviour yeah. and the saviour is exactly the blood of Jesus will not save you from Covid-19 and you see again we have to say this that if you are with the narrative as a Christian if you are with the narrative then that's the side you are on whether you would say that yourself or whether you've ever seen the post or not, you are on that side. And it, and it is time to get on the right side of, of this. Because, you see, the information is all out there. You, you know, ig there's ignorance and there is willful ignorance. Do you see? Ignorance is when, well, I didn't know. And the information wasn't available. But you see, all the information is now available. They would have you believe, yeah, but only from conspiracy websites. Not at all. Not at all. The information is all there. Is that a conspiracy? Is, is that something somebody's just made up? No, it's actually happened. The, the film footage from Australia, is that something that somebody made up? No, it's what is actually happening. So it's time to get on the right side of right here, as far as I can see. Because, because my people are being destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because they have refused knowledge. Time to wake up. And I pray, I pray that the Christians will wake up before it's too late. Because my people are destroyed. If they continue down the path that they are taking, just because they're Christians doesn't mean to say they will not become a statistic. Just like countless thousands of other people have. That's the reality of it. But I don't know what you do to wake them up. And I'm, I mean, in a sense, I'm just, I'm just preaching to the converted here, aren't I? I'm just preaching to the converted. I think there are, there, are, there are Christians I know and they deliberately don't listen to this. So what do you do? See, they long since decided that 
if you don't agree with the narrative, you're a conspiracy theorist and that's it. And you get called dangerous, you get called all those things. But what can you do? Let's just pray that the Lord will open people's eyes before it's too late. Father, I thank you that, Lord, you, you love your people just as you love your people in the Old Testament. And, Lord, you sent people to warn them. You sent your prophets, you put watchmen, Lord, uh, amongst your people to warn them. And, Lord, you, your prophets rose up early and spoke your word and continued to do so, even though, Lord, it was... It cost them dearly, many of them. Some were in prison, some were killed. As Jesus once said, which of the prophets did your fathers not kill? Lord, they were in prison. They were brutally treated and murdered. And Lord, we're coming to the New Testament. We find the same there. And, and so it's always gone on. But Lord, we, we're in this situation now. And Lord, it's not a trivial matter. It's no longer just about, well, do I think it's a disease? Or do I think it's a serious disease? Or do I not? Or do I think face masks work? Or do I not? Lord, that discussion, Lord, was over a long time ago. Lord, it isn't about those things. This is about global tyranny. This is, this is about something that is destroying people's lives. Lord, and this is something that, Lord, will bring people into slavery. Lord, once they accept this digital past that is coming in, Lord, and we can see it coming in, Lord, once that happens, then freedom is gone for, for so many people. And, um, and again, Lord, that would affect the Christian just as it affects the non-Christian. Lord, I thank you that, Lord, you've enlightened your people. You've given your people revelation knowledge and understanding about these things. Lord, grant that, Lord, we might live in the good of it. Lord, we think of Jehoshaphat, a godly man, certainly a true believer, and yet for some reason, for some reason he decided to go along with the narrative, so to speak. Lord, maybe to please Ahab, maybe because he thought it would ultimately be, it would ultimately bring good, it may ultimately bring the people together, whatever his reasons. He went along with the narrative and nigh, he even nearly lost his life. Lord, but for the grace of God, he would have done. Lord, I, I pray that you'll waken your people up and help us to come to an understanding of, of the truth and of what we need to do as your people in these days. Lord, it seems to me that, Lord, we're coming to the end of this year and already they're starting to ramp up the, the, the rhetoric as far as this new thing allegedly is concerned and Lord no doubt they'll bring measures in very soon but Lord as we come into next year it seems to me that the, 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 the pressure is going to increase as time goes by and Lord we your people we need to be strong we need to be people of knowledge and understanding and so I pray that you'll help us to understand our times and know what to do lead us and guide us by your spirit and through your word we pray give us revelation knowledge each step of the way and uh, help us lord to help others help us lord to make a good good case for the truth when we find ourselves in conversation with people lord but above all lord we we just ask that you would open people's eyes for this we ask in jesus name we pray amen